I just wanted to um, start off by playing a game with you guys because I thought we should think a little bit about what makes things interesting and fun. And as you all know, there's nothing more interesting and fun than noughts and crosses. So who wants to go one-on-one -on -one with me in a game of noughts and crosses? Yes, what's your name? What? Luke. Luke. Okay, Luke. Now, are you aware of the rules? Okay, I'm playing the normal uh, Russian variant. Do you want to go first? What's that? Okay. Pick your square. We'll number them to make it unambiguous. Well, oh, well, look, I'm a computing person. What should I start numbering from? Zero. I should start numbering from zero. Okay, go. Luke, which one? A cross in two. <laughs> Queen's Gambit. Nought in four. Number six. What's that? I've lost. I cannot believe that's the case. You forget who has the piece of jock, my friend. Um, I do seem to have lost. Now I think about it. What a stupid game Norton Crosses is. What about if I did this? Ha ha! Oh, number seven, not so cocky now. What if I did this? Zero. Oh. You see what I did then? I mixed up where you were telling me to put it and what I had to put there. It's a very common mistake. Um, look, I think uh, I'll, I'll just go here and maybe we can call it a draw. I don't think we need to even make that last move. Unless you really want to. You do? Okay. You're not really trusting me, are you? <laughs> All right, that's Knots and Crosses. Now, who thinks that's the most awesome? Thank you, Luke, by the way. You know, the weird thing was, I had thought, I thought you'd actually won then too when I looked at that, because I had like childhood kindergarten memories of playing this game and thought, that's not a good pattern, but whew, it was okay. Um, luckily, I didn't give up. Luckily, I persevered. So, who thinks Knots and Crosses is an awesome game? Oh, you guys are weird. It's a stupid game. It's so boring. I can't believe I was interested in it when I was young. All right, so we're not going to play any more of Noughts and Crosses. Instead, we're going to proceed with the lecture. All right, there's my laptop. A security update. Who would have thought? So we'll just ask later because you don't need to ever install those things. This is my laptop. It's displaying a web page. Who has seen this web page? Oh, well done. People that have been exploring. How did you find it? You Googled it. What did you, what words did you actually Google? Comp 1917. And it got this page, did it? Oh, that's right. That's awesome. Now, you, have, you don't have to, but you'll notice I have actually logged in. You guys, if I wasn't logged in, if I logged out, let's see what it would look like. It's actually going to take me to the wrong page when I log out. I'll have to come back here. It takes me to the UNSW Open Learning General site. I'm logged out. You're not yet logged in. Become a member. So if I wanted to register, say if I was you, I would click here and it will ask me some questions. The main thing is, what's my quest? <laughs> so you would register by going, become a member. Yes, please. Type, make sure you, you can type your full name in here, Joseph Bell. Type it nicely because it will appear everywhere. So maybe put capital letters and things in and then you'd fill the rest in and, and click on the register button and then you'll be in. Let's go to the schedule though. This is the page we'll always go to. Right down the bottom is a link that says schedule, and on that schedule is what we're doing each week, blow by blow. And at the moment we're in week one. What should I have numbered the weeks from, being a computing person? Zero. I should have numbered them from zero. I can't believe I didn't do that. Um, there's lab zero there that if you clicked on it, click on lab zero, and just go through these activities one at a time. You might not be able to do them all, and you might get stuck on some, but just have a go at it. There's okay, so I'll go to the schedule, go to today's lecture notes. And here they are. Let me make them a bit bigger for you. So today's lecture is called Rules. Now, um, 
you'll notice a couple of things about the notes just really quickly. A, my spelling's really bad. B, I'm really messy. C, I forget a lot of things. And uh, F, I sometimes leave lots of gaps in the lecture notes. So I think it's really good to come to the lectures because just looking at the notes, they might be a bit cryptic later on and might not make any sense. Now, we have a tradition in this course that the lecture notes are actually written by you guys. And you write them on the wiki here, and then everyone sees the notes. Does that make sense? Other people are welcome to come along and correct the notes and fix them up if you've made mistakes. But the idea is we all collaboratively, or you all collaboratively, build your own set of notes. And at the end of the course, I print them out. I call it the course textbook, and I give it to you, and you can take it into the exam. It's like an open book exam with a course textbook. So if you've written awesome notes, the exam's really easy. Um, so yeah, uh, we talked about the pi player piano. Remember I showed you a pianola piano roll, and I asked you the question, do you think a player piano with a piano, pianola, with a, like that music, the roll, is that, a, is that in some sense equivalent to a computer? Is that some sort of computer? And I ask you to think about that. We'll come back to that today. So I hope you're still thinking about ticking it over, and if any time during the day-to-day, -day, the lecture today gets boring, I'd like you to return to that question and just think of the answer. And as I, we talked about solving problems yesterday, when you've worked out the answer and you know what it is, what should you do? Should you think, oh, good, I've finished, I can move on to the next thing? No, no, you think, oh, that's an interesting possible answer. I'll come back later on and think about it from another angle because maybe there's some other answers to this question. So don't, don't ever feel too confident that you've worked it out. Or that, no, you probably have worked it out, but don't ever feel too confident that you've worked out everything you need to know about it, if that makes sense. You can always get more out of something if it's an interesting thing, if you look at it for a bit longer. Although I'm not going to talk much about, at this stage, the exercise I asked you to do with estimating the number of pieces of toast that would take to fill this lecture theatre, I did um, want to talk about one particular sort of answer that I got that impressed me. I saw many answers that impressed me, and we will, after, in the next lot of lectures, talk about the different categories of answers we got and general observations I've got about you, the strategies you guys are using to solve problems. But um, one particular thing that really impressed me was a couple of people said, well, just get a toaster and some bread, start toasting it, <laughs> put them in and count and see. No, in some senses, yeah, in some senses that's a stupid answer, you know, because, yeah, it'll never, yeah. But in some senses, also, it's a brilliant answer, because instead of being stuck or not knowing how to start, they thought, well, what can I do? They couldn't work it out some other way, so they thought, well, what I can do is I can get bread and I can get toast and I can start doing it. So I think that's actually a really good way to attack a problem if you're stuck, is start playing around with it. So, yeah, sure, start toasting some toast and stacking them up and see. Maybe that'll start giving you some insights into what's going on. I call that the try it strategy, and I think it's really important in computing. You can talk and talk and talk forever, but somehow it's really important when you do something rather than talk about it. So a lot of people, for example, didn't give a number. They didn't say how many pieces of toast would fit in. They just theorized about possible ways of doing it. And I was really impressed by the people that, that gave an answer, that gave a number, that gave it a shot, that tried. Even though they might be wrong, they weren't afraid of being wrong, they just had a try. And I think in computing, if you're always afraid of being wrong, you will be paralyzed and never do anything. So it's always good just to try and start, especially with a problem. So in honor of, of them, today I did bring in our toaster. <laughs> now luckily we did the fire alarm drill last lecture, didn't we? Does everyone know? Did you notice how those maths people filed out of the room then after that last lecture? Were they hopeless or what? It took them like 10 minutes to get out. If there was a fire, I was tempted. <laughs> so obviously they were going out and just like standing near the door and relaxing. And, and you guys probably weren't helping because I saw you making like a human wall so no one could get out of the theatre. <laughs> and it's this friction effect. And we often notice that with cars and traffic. Have you ever noticed that? That after an accident, everyone slows down. But then when everyone starts to speed up again, it takes a really long time, even after the accident's cleared before everyone's moving at good speed. It's just somehow everyone... In fact, uh, some friends of mine do traffic flow analysis, whoops, and they said they've worked out to get people through a tunnel, it's actually faster if you put a set of traffic lights in front of the tunnel for no reason at all. <laughs> make it go red for a while and then make it go green and then everyone races through <laughs> and if you just leave it, everyone just slows down and does the, I call it the math student effect. So if there's a fire, can everyone just get away as fast as you can, not thinking the fire alarm could go off because who would be lunatic enough to cook toast in a lecture theatre? But you never know. So, <laughs> so I brought some toast. Let's give it a go. Um, now, I'm not suggesting this will solve the problem, but it might be an interesting way of approaching the problem. And as I said yesterday, toast is so delicious that I don't know why. You put bread in, you get toast out. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. It's fantastic. <laughs> Life's good like that. There we go. Would anyone like a piece of toast? Did anyone miss breakfast? Yeah, okay. All right. Oh, sure. Now, if it starts to smoke... Oh... 
that's not good. If it starts to smoke, please tell me, because I'm sure there are fire alarms in this place. I really should have tested it before I came in. Who thinks? Let's have a bet. Who thinks I'm going to set off the fire alarm? Okay, one, two. Who's going to dob me in if I do set the fire alarm off? I have a good fire alarm story. Don't get out. I have a good fire alarm story I'll tell you later on, but um, maybe when we're not recording. Okay, let me just... Oh, in fact... <laughs> we can cut this out. Okay. All right, there we go. Um, so I wanted to... Oh, yeah, and bagels. Today's lecture is based on a bagel. It is on. This is a bagel from the cafe on campus. And it's really delicious. And just this morning, I had this longing to have one of their lovely blueberry bagels. What is this? Someone tell me. Food. It's a bagel. Who said a bagel? Yes, it's a bagel. <laughs> Who said food? Yeah, it's food. It's a torus. It's a one torus. A torus with one hole in it. What else is it? It's a model of the universe. It's a model of the universe I want to live in. That's right. That's right. What else is it? It's a sugar-free donut. Well, except for the top. <laughs> it's a wheel. It's a wheel? It's one? Lots, Lots of atoms. It's a collection of atoms. What sort of atoms, probably? Lots of carbon, I would guess. Carbon? Smokes when you cook it. Let's see how this is going. Oh, it looks lovely. Now, this is our first test. We're just verifying that the size of the piece of bread doesn't change when it's toasted. Actually, I think it's a bit thicker. What do you think? You are correct in that assumption. Good grief. <laughs> Who expected that? That it would get thicker when you cooked it. <laughs> All right. That's right. Okay. Good. Maybe it's an erratic cutting machine. <laughs> Let's get two that are level. And initially, that's really unexpected. All right. These two are the same thickness initially. I'm going to put one in. Ooh. Who would like a piece of toast? Someone up here. Very. Does this smell nice? Yeah. Somewhere bakery near my house. It's very yummy. Oh yeah, I'm only supposed to put one in. Thank you. Yes. The experiment was so good we put the control in too. Who would like the other one? It's not so hot anymore, but it's still yummy. There you go. Hold on. All right. So this is. I'm going to stop fingering it because someone might want to eat it. This is a bagel, but it's also a collection of atoms. It's a collection of molecules. It's a collection of, it's, it's a whole lot of ingredients. It's flour and, I don't know how you make bagels. What's in it? Egg? Flour and egg? Milk, maybe? Okay. Which of those descriptions is the right description of this thing? All of them. But yet they all bring out different, I mean, what, well, what's your favorite description of it? It's delicious is a good way of thinking. It's just a food unit, a delicious food unit. What's your favorite one and why? Which description is best? Bagel is probably most useful. Yeah, unless you were like on some weird, you were allergic to things or something like that. Then you might be more interested in it as a collection of ingredients, say if you were allergic to gluten or something. Or if you were really obsessed with losing weight, you might be merely interested in it as, as its calcium, as its carbohydrate, protein, fat breakdown or something. Or, you know, so there could be different ways of viewing it. But yeah, I think bagel is a reasonably good summary description. Notice that the different descriptions are, in some senses, equivalent, but there's a difference. If I told you where every atom in this was, I've somehow given you more information than just if I say it's a bagel. Would you agree? But in some sense, I've also somehow given you less information than if I'd said it was a bagel. Because I could give you a whole telephone book list of all the atoms. Well, it would be several telephone books. I wonder how many. I wonder if it would fill the room. A lot of descriptions of where all the atoms were, and you might not realize that it was a delicious thing to eat. You just view it as a whole lot of atoms. So in some sense, as you move through these different levels of abstraction, as we called them, you have different views of the same thing. And there's different amounts of information available at every view. And each view is sort of motivated by being interested in different things. And I view abstracting something as really throwing away information about it. So I'm going to throw away, for example, I don't really care which carbon atom is at position number this. It could be this carbon atom or that carbon atom. And as far as I'm concerned, it would still taste the same. There's a whole lot of equivalent things that are sort of irrelevant that I could throw away and not make any difference. And probably if I'd taken the bagel next to it, I'd like it just as much as this bagel, even though they have no atoms in common at all. In some sense, they'd almost be interchangeable in my mind if I was merely interested in bagels rather than that particular bagel. So the first description wouldn't be as useful as the second one. So 
just notice that there are lots of different descriptions at lots of different levels with lots of different, and each of them has a different amount of meaning, talks about different things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the theme of abstraction that we'll be following through the course. Now let me just, oh, oh no, they're the same size. Okay, so it was just erratically cut. Well done to whoever suggested that. Does anyone want another piece of, yes. Okay. Uh, you have to share with him. He's sharing, we like it. Okay, so that was about, does anyone want a bagel? You can't have it, I love it, it's so delicious. <laughs> All right, so we've talked about abstraction. We've talked about abstraction in the um, description of something. Whether I describe it as a bagel or so on, so on, so on. And the other example I gave yesterday was a book. When we describe a book, we could view it as a collection of words and letters. But presumably you could see you could change some of the letters around with other letters and it'd still be essentially the same book. You could even probably interchange some of the words around and it'd still be somehow the same book. A human being we looked at as collections of atoms and cells and so on and so on. But, I mean, someone even noticed this really early. My only one of the Greek philosophers that I could lose my arm and sort of still be me. And my cells go and new cells are born, but I'm still me. And probably over a seven-year period, all the cells in my bodies have changed, I'm guessing, but probably. And I'm essentially made of entirely different matter to what I was made of seven years ago. But in some sense, I'm sort of still the same. So somehow... Um, uh, All right, let, before I draw a conclusion from that, um, the conclusion I, I, I'm trying to draw is this property called emergence. Has anyone heard of emergence? How would you describe emergence? Does anyone know what emergence is? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, something that comes out of a complex system that essentially something, when the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, when somehow something emerges, like I, I know where all the atoms are, sure, and it's a bagel. I sell, assemble all the cells in the body and I've got consciousness. I know how all the raindrops are reflecting light and I get a rainbow. We have a series of rules about how to put noughts and crosses on a board and we have fun playing a game. Somehow out of the little details of the system, which in some sense fully describe the system, the system viewed at a higher level has new properties that sort of seem to emerge out of nowhere that are really interesting. And this is what we're going to see happening over and over and over again in computing when we're programming, this notion of emergence. So I think of it as like a rainbow. Describing a rainbow by talking about light and drops of water to me seems to sort of miss the whole point of the glory of a beautiful rainbow. Okay, so we've looked at abstraction in the description of things, but actually I really want to talk about abstraction in a different sense. I want to talk about abstraction because knowing... What that bagel was is of some interest, but of more interest is knowing how I could make one, how I can get more. I'm a fairly practical person. So the description of a bagel that would be most useful for me is how to make one. Now I'm going to draw it like this. A bagel takes in a whole lot of ingredients, and the cook does something to them, cooks them, and out comes a bagel. Does that make sense? This is the sort of process. Now, I want you to notice that abstraction can live it in two different places in this picture. First of all, the ingredients like the flour and the eggs, sugar. In some sense, this is sugar, but in another sense, it's a, you know, it's a molecule, an organic chemist. And in another sense, so there's different ways of viewing all these ingredients. We could abstract up and down, but probably the most useful level for a cook, uh, as a human being, is viewing them by their common sort of names that you'd buy them in the supermarket. But you, you still could describe eggs in lots of different ways. And you could, uh, does everyone make sense? You can view up and down an abstraction on the ingredients going in. And this is like the ingredients of the process is like the data coming in. So we can have what we call data abstraction. This is where the, the stuff coming into something you can view it in lots of different ways. And you choose the most useful way to view it. And they're all equivalent. None of them is right or wrong. It's just, it's useful to pick one way if you're carrying out a task. It helps you to talk about it as sugar rather than talking about it as or C H O C H O O O C or something. Oh, it's like chocolate. Um, but the other level of abstraction is inside here. The process you go through to combine them to make the product, I could say you cook them. But what else could I say? I could say mix this with that and slowly. I could give you the actual recipe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Suppose this is a, a, um, a thing that one of my lecturers did to me when I was at uni. He got a piece of bread. I, I didn't bring any ingredients except the bread, but let's just imagine I was very organized and had. And he said, 
I'm from some foreign country. Denmark, say. A backwards country that doesn't understand <laughs> peanut butter sandwiches. I want, I want, I, how do you speak in Danish? I don't want to insult anyone from Denmark, but it's a silly sounding accent, isn't it? <laughs> um, where's all this anti-Danishness coming from? It's crazy. Okay, so it's because they're warmongers. Always in the UN, bringing about peace. Um, <laughs> Okay, so let's just move away from Danes because it gets me too angry. And so I'm down the front. I'm some Danish guy, Hort Gefloten, and I have to put make a peanut butter sandwich, but I've never heard of it before. So I want you to give me the description of making a peanut butter sandwich. Now, you could say to me, Richard, make a peanut butter sa sandwich. At one level of abstraction, that's exactly what you want me to do. But I'll go, oh, I don't understand, man. I'm Danish. So can you give me a better description? What do I do? Put peanut butter on two slices of bread. Okay, so here's what I do. I get the jar of peanut butter. I put it on one of the pieces of bread. And then I take it off and put it on the other one. Then I take it off and I put them together. And I've... <laughs> that's, why Danish, that's why they conquered the world. Okay, so that's what I've done, but I haven't done it. Somehow I've legitimately misinterpreted your instructions. So probably you need to go to a lower level of abstraction and give me more precise instructions. Can someone try and precisely tell me how to make a slice of bread? Yeah. Get two slices of bread. Yes. Take the first slice. Yes. Get your jar of peanut butter and yes. a knife. Yes. Get approximately five to ten grams of peanut butter. Yes. Put a piece of the first piece of bread. Yes. Then put the second piece of bread on top of the first piece of bread. Well done. What's your name? Samuel Baxter. Well done, Samuel Baxter. Okay, here we go. Did everyone hear those instructions? First of all, take two pieces of bread. Take the first piece of bread. I like the way you did that, so it's really clear which piece it is. Uh, and I put it down there, and I have to open, get a jar of peanut butter and a knife. And now I have to put ten grams of peanut butter on the knife. I can't get the peanut butter on the knife, man. Do you want to? I'm going to let you revise your instructions. Take the lid off by turning it counter. Oh, you're very good, because I was going to try and pull it off. All right, all right. <laughs> I'm turning the lid. The whole jar's turning. It's not coming off. <laughs> this is not made in Ikea. I've got an Allen key. How can I open it up? Hold the bottom, turn the top. OK, I take the lid off. All right, I'm, I'm being obnoxious. But can you see? I can literally misinterpret what you're saying. Then get a knife. I'm going to put 10, 5 to 10 grams of peanut butter on. That doesn't sound like very much, but I'm going to do that. Then I'm going to spread it evenly all over the first piece of bread, so I'll just go like this. <laughs> Thank you. That was a brilliant description, by the way. I wasn't making fun of you. It was an awesome description. I have actually done this exercise before. Oh, you've done this exercise before, but I still got you. <laughs>
It's an AMD version of the 8088, really early microprocessor chip. Can you see it here? Just essentially a bit of epoxy with a whole lot of legs coming out. And the legs are wires, and they're attached to circuits inside. And all this chip does is essentially a microprocessor. All it does is this. It loops through memory one at a time. It fetches an instruction from memory. And it's got a little program inside it that loops through memory and fetches instructions one at a time. And that program's very, very simple. And it knows if it gets to the end of memory to jump back to the beginning and do it again. It loops through memory, fetching instructions one at a time. Then it looks up for each instruction what to do. And there's a very simple task it does for every instruction. And that is a program. OK, now, that's not a very interesting chip. So let's look at a more interesting. Oh, I had an Eccles's tune. I'll play Eccles's tune later on. OK, because I want to show you. Uh, that's the 4000 chip. 4000 series microprocessor. Can you see? Blank is hold, X is beep, zero is pause. And I haven't put in all the little details. It's actually got two registers called an IP and an IS that I didn't bother to explain. The IP is the instruction pointer. And that just stores the number of what we're up to. So initially it has zero. And then after I've ex executed the first instruction, the zero instruction, this number increases to one. And that tells me to look at the next instruction. And then that number increases to two. And that tells me to look at the next instruction. And, this, and the microprocessor just slowly increases this numbers one at a time as it fetches the instruction. And it's got an instruction store. And literally what it does is it looks up the number in here. Oh, that's a three. It goes to cell number three. It copies cell number three into register IS, which is a zero. And then it, look, depending on the value in IS, it does one of these three things. Then it goes back, and then it just repeats. It loops again. So then it increases this, finds what's in number here, copies it into there. Oh, another zero. Executes it, and so on. Does that make sense? All right, that's the 4000 series microprocessor. We're going to be programming these things. Now, the 4,000 is so basic, it's not very interesting. So we're not going to bother programming that, probably. But do pay attention, because we'll be programming the series. We're going to make it a little better. We're going to make it a little more complex. At the moment, it's as boring as noughts and crosses, right? But let's make it more interesting. The 4001 series microprocessor. Right, it looks exactly the same as the 4000 series, except it also has, let's have some lights. It has more memory. Nine wasn't enough. It has 16. It has another register called register R. And instead of just having three possible values, naught or a cross or a blank, it has eight possible values. Oh, well, six, I guess. Uh, well, no, it has eight possible. Well, let's say it has eight, zero to seven. All right, so I'm going to execute this program. Let's write a program here. Halt is now zero. Uh, instruction one increases whatever number's in here. Initially, everything starts at zero. Two increases it by two. Instruction three increases it by four. And instruction four increases it by eight. So I'm starting off with zero in here initially. Give me a program that will put seven in there. One, two, three. Will that do it? One, two, three. Yes. Zero. Oh, well, I need to print it out. Seven. Seven. And then I'd better halt. And we actually say, if you don't tell me cells, I'll just assume they're all filled with zero. So I'm prepared to call this a one, two, three, four byte program to, to produce the number seven. Oh, and it's got a seven at the end. Is that a very interesting computer? No. If I was to ask you to print seven, is there another program, by the way, that would print seven? Yeah, how would that go? Seven ones? Or what about a one, two, two, seven, zero? Is that going to do it? OK, there's a couple of different programs that have the same effect. OK, that's a 4001 series microprocessor. It never really took off. I don't know why. So let's look at the 4002 series microprocessor. All right, it's got less instructions, but actually it's a bit more interesting. Uh, because it lets you increase and it lets you decrease. And we're going to say that we've got the numbers now from, one, from 0 to 15. So without me telling you all the little side rules, see if you can guess them, how am I going to quickly generate the number 1? 
One, seven, zero. Okay, how am I going to generate the number 14? Two. Two. Two, seven, zero. Yeah, we're going to wrap around. So I've got the numbers 1 to 15. So if you start at 0 and go back, it's like a clock. Yeah, if you start at 0 o'clock and go back, it's 11 o'clock because clocks worth work base 12. Well, we're working base 16. So if you start at 0 and go back, you get to 15. So let's go back twice. Okay, this program is more interesting because we get a bit more arithmetic, but still not a very interesting microprocessor. Again, this one flopped. It's like the guy, Victor Borger talks about this, the guy that invented 1-up and then he invented 2-up, then he invented 3-up, then he invented 4-up, then he invented 5-up and 6-up, and he said, I'll never make money out of soft drinks. And he didn't know how close he got. <laughs> it's, it's not my joke, but... Okay, these, these, this is 2-up. This isn't so good. Let's try the 4003. And this is the one I want to show you before the break because I've got a puzzle for you. Look at the 4003. It's more interesting. It's got two registers. R0, we're going to call them now, and R1. You can add and subtract one from each of those registers. You've got a hold like normal. You've got instruction five that swaps the two registers around. You've got something to beep, because you never know when you're going to need to beep. And you've got something to print out R0. You've also got, because up until now, all our programs have been the same. They've not been very interesting. They've just been able to do some calculations. And every time they run, what happens? Given a program, every time you run it, yeah, it resets, and it, it sort of always does the same thing. It just goes through instructions in turn. It doesn't make any choices. It doesn't do any thinking and considering. It just does the same thing. We need a program that can make some choices to make it a more powerful thing. And now we're making our rules a bit more complex and having slightly more rules. Very, very soon, in fact, actually now, as soon as I give you this next instruction, we're going to have this emergence thing happening, that suddenly we've got enough rules, even though it only seems like I'm adding two more rules, that the thing changes from being an idiot computer to as powerful as any modern computer. Except for the fact it's only got 16 memory addresses. <laughs> I've got to fix that problem. But theoretically, in terms of what it can do, it's got two things it consider and combine, make a decision, and combined with that, it's got the ability to jump. So these are two byte instructions. They take up two spaces. Each of these instructions took up one space. But each of these take up two spaces. The first space is the number of the instruction. Like if I was doing eight, I could say eight, 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 one. All right, how does this program run? It says jump to the instruction at the second byte. The second byte we'll call the address if R0 is not equal to 0. So let's execute the program, see if you can imagine what it is. What's R0 initially? What's R0 now? 15. What's R0 now? 14. 7. What are we printing out? 14. Hold. Oh, that's not very good. <laughs> Let's print it out twice. Okay, then what? Is R0 equal to 0? No, so we're going to jump to instruction 1. And what are we going to do? So it's going to say 13. Print 13, 13. And then we're going to jump to instruction 1, and it's going to print 12, 11, 10. It's going to keep going. When it halts, what's the last thing it will have printed out? 0. Okay. Can you see that? This is a program to count down to 0. This ability to make decisions and jump based on those decisions, although it seems trivial, is now enough that these very, very basic, simple rules, and what I like about these rules compared to, say, the rules we were talking about before. The rules we were talking about before are useful. They're human rules, aren't they? Butter a piece of toast is what you want to tell your daughter. You don't want to say to your daughter, oh, by the way, can you get the peanut butter, hold the bottom, turn the top, anti-clockwise, put five grams on a knife, spread it out literally on the top of the first piece, and then it... It's, life's too short to do that, and it misses the whole point of what she's trying to do. You want to say, just make the human uh, peanut butter. But if you're talking about rules to a computer, which is really literal, which is going to... It's like a Dane, okay? Any, there is nothing like a Dane. It's, it's, it's going to literally do whatever you tell it, and it'll make mistakes whenever it possibly can. So these rules are clear and unambiguous, but they're painfully small, because to be unambiguous, we have to be really precise and not too much. This, by just executing these rules can now do all sorts of amazing things. So my challenge for you is this. Between now and the next lecture, can you write a program for the 4003 chip that, given two numbers, 
maybe one of them stored in R0 initially and one of them stored in R1 initially. Given two numbers here, like three and four, the program runs and when it halts at the end, R0 contains the sum of these two numbers. In other words, can you write a program to add two numbers together? And if you can, and it'll be really hard, but try, you'll be able to go home and tell your mum today, today I tried really, really hard and I learned how to add three and four. <laughs> okay. Now, does anyone have any questions about anything? Okay, so I'll see you. Yes, question. What do the registries start at? What, the reg everything starts at zero unless otherwise told. So in this case, I'm saying assume they've both got a value in them. But normally when you turn the computer on, everything's cleared out. Yeah. But in this case, I'm saying suppose, because this program's going to be embedded inside another program one day, and that other program will put two values in it, then call your program, and it'll want your program to add them together. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes. Yes. Um, how do you know which address to jump to? Oh, how do you know which address to jump to? It's the second byte. So these instructions, the eight and nine instructions take two bytes, and the second byte tells it where to jump to. After executing that, it actually increases this by two. So after executing this, the next instruction will be that. I right, go. Have fun. See you, everyone. I want you to add that. I want you to do R0 equals R0. Awesome.